there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Deep down in the ocean, a treasure is sleeping. It is full of metals that we need desperately. But to this day, this subterraneous world remains as foreign to us as the moon. A mysterious universe populated by unique creatures. And yet, the industrialization of the deep sea is imminent. Can manganese nodules solve our raw material problems? Science ought to answer this question. It's the year 2077. What once seemed like a futuristic dream is now a reality. Flying cars, unlimited communication, and mobility. From another perspective, however, we've become even more dependent on the metals that make our nice lives possible. The middle of the Pacific. A good 60 years ago, we saw a way out of the raw materials crisis here. Today, an old research vessel sails across the area that Germany, the economic powerhouse, is supposed to save. It was once here already on its maiden voyage. Even back then, the markets were nervous as metals were becoming in ever shorter supply. Sixty years prior, the MS Zona was the pride of German ocean research. The new research vessel from the Kiel Center for Oceanic Research, GEOMAR, is on the verge of its very first exploratory trip, which is set to take several months. Scientists from all over the world want to explore the seabed of the Pacific. To do so, they will inevitably need to look to the future, a future in which raw materials will be mined from the seabed. What will happen to this untouched part of the Earth when people start to intrude here? Researchers know that an industry utilizing deep sea mining will advance well in an ecosystem that is important for the whole planet. The geochemist Matthias Heckel has worked with this unique world for decades. We can make a very good comparison between the seabed and the rainforest. Like all systems in which only few nutrients are available, we find a great deal of biodiversity. This is the case in the rainforest and in the deep sea alike. That means there are very few individuals and species, but with great variety amongst them. The researchers at least want to help to limit the damage that mining the metals from the seabed will cause. But to stop the mining altogether, the expedition leader Jens Greinert is a realist. We can't turn back the clock to a time when we didn't need oars. We also can't say to someone, don't use your iPhone or your computer anymore. Oh, and there's no TV either. So that means we'll always need oars and we'll need more at that. We should make the effort to reduce our need for new oars as much as possible, but we'll always need more. We need to think, where are the oars supposed to come from? Sources on land are limited. We've been doing that for a fair while now, and major ore mines are slowly drying up. The wounds that we inflict on the earth when we mine ore are immense. Chile has the largest copper deposits in the world. 
In fact, the whole country's economy is dependent upon it. That comes at a cost. It is not possible for life to exist in the areas surrounding the largest copper mines in the world. Open cast mining has polluted the environment. What's more, just a few states are responsible for mining many ores. For example, China, which has a virtual monopoly on the rare earth metals that are vital for computers and mobile phones. Prices soared beyond measure when, in 2009, the emerging Chinese economy decided to no longer sell rare earth metals to other countries. Rare earth metals, copper, nickel, cobalt, and chrome. Without these non-ferrous metals, our entire modern technology world would collapse. They're found in every electrical device. We can no longer imagine our lives without them. What's the solution? Preaching on cutting down our consumption and making the smartphone generation responsible is just too short-sighted. Even environmentally friendly technology such as wind power demands large amounts of copper. Around 30 to 60 tons of copper are built into every wind power plant. Germany has a long tradition of ore mining. There were once ore mines all over the country. The ore mountains even owe their name to these rich resources. Ores were mined in Germany up until the 1970s, and even until after the fall of the Berlin Wall in East Germany. The country was, to a large extent, independent from foreign imports. But the mines have long since been abandoned. The concentration of ores in the earth is in too short a supply compared to the mines abroad. Only ruins, traditions, and memorials are left as reminders of the mines. Meanwhile, Germany has made a name for herself in the world of metal recycling. The largest copper recycling plant in the world is in Hamburg. Nowadays in this country, up to 43% of copper is reused, an astoundingly high rate that remains unparalleled elsewhere. The metal can be recycled without its quality diminishing. The problem, however, is recycling alone is not enough, if the hum of the economy is to continue at least. Things can only be recycled that have already been used and have reached the end of their lifespan. Copper from mobile phones and electronic devices tends to land in the melting plant only after around two to 10 years. Larger amounts of copper, for example, from house building, tend to only be recycled after over around 30 years of use. However, copper usage in the EU continues to increase each year. Economists see that as a good sign. They even speak about Dr. Copper, who is a sign of stable economic growth. On the other hand, it means as long as production does not go down drastically, more and more copper will need to be mined. The ore from recycling can never be enough. Today, the price of copper is subject to strong fluctuations caused by speculation. An alternative? The nodules in the deep sea. What do they contain and what's the cost? Deep sea research explains how economics and ecology can be compatible. If we're to mine the deep sea, it needs to be done as responsibly as possible. And to do that, we need to conduct environmental research. Because if we don't understand it fully, we can't mine in an ecologically sound way. 
And what's more, scientists are more suited to the task than those who want to mine the nodules because their primary goal is to mine, even if they say that they'll take a little care of the environment. Our primary interest is to understand the environment. Pioneering work is absolutely necessary in the case of the deep sea, as the ecosystem here remains almost completely unknown to us. Researchers first want to find out about the life that inhabits the fields of manganese nodules on the expedition. The metal and sand nodules have already been lying here for millions of years. They're utilizing various methods to go about this. This claw cuts out pieces of the seabed, takes it up to researchers on the ship from a depth of four kilometers. There are manganese nodules in all of the oceans, but only in the Pacific in the so-called manganese nodule belt, do they reach such a high density that industrial mining really makes sense. One hundred and fifty years ago, the expedition, the Challenger, provided an insight into this mysterious world. A good 20 years later, the first German deep sea expedition followed with Valdivia. In 1898, the German Empire wanted to no longer lag behind Great Britain. For months, their researchers sailed through the Arctic. Back then, the conventional thought was still prevalent that the deep seabed was a lifeless desert. The German scientists tried to research the seabed with trawl nets. As the first nets were lifted, there was great surprise. It was clear that countless animals were living on the seabed, and almost all of them were unknown to the researchers. Up on deck, they examined and categorized the foreign organisms. They brought home countless specimens and detailed illustrations with them. Even today, scientists have not yet managed to finish examining all of the containers of mysterious creatures. Unlike their colleagues in past centuries, modern sea researchers are now able to observe animals on the ocean floor in their element. They've known for a long time that the deep sea follows its own rules. The clocks of the deep sea tick to their own rhythm. The animals here grow slowly and become very old, many only reaching sexual maturity at 30 or 50 years old. The manganese nodule evolves in this mysterious world. It always needs a core. Many modules contain shark teeth. Metals dissolved in the water slowly accumulate around the core, a process that takes millions of years until finally a fist-sized nodule has formed. But how does this slow universe react to attacks from the outside? 
Sea biologists asked this question in the 1980s. Even then, intensive debate surrounded manganese nodule mining. In order to imitate a disruption similar to that of mining, they lowered a plowing harrow down into the deep and pulled it across the seabed, 78 times in total. Seven years later, in 1996, they found the same spot in order to check the test area. The marks left were still visible. Today, a good quarter of a century after the original experiment, they're traveling back there again. More than anything, by now it has become much clearer how little we know about the deep seabed. Matthias Heckel accompanied the party in 1996 as a young doctoral student. The deep sea covers 70% of the surface of our Earth, and we have, up until now, really only made point measurements. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we thought everything in the deep sea was pretty much the same, even in an area such as where we are right now. Now we're in an area of two sea miles in diameter, so about three and a half or four kilometers large. And normally, we always thought that on the scale of several tens of kilometers, everything is homogeneous and the same. And now we're seeing that even here in these three or four kilometers, the variability is relatively large. The claw will show how much of the variety is still present. If it has brought a piece of the seabed as planned, it will deliver valuable findings. Every single specimen taken in the deep sea is a small piece of a mosaic that can generate more knowledge. A lucky turn. It's a good haul. The sea biologists carefully retrieve the sediment and nodules. Every single sample will be examined immediately on deck and later analyzed further on land. Because such an expedition guzzles a lot of money, work is continuously done on the zona around the clock. Researchers from all over the world share the layers out and use every single minute. Slowly, the sediment releases its treasure. The manganese nodules are measured and weighed. From an economical perspective, it's true to say, the bigger, the more valuable. Large nodules are easier to mine. They required millions of years to grow to that size. The sea has always fascinated mankind. Endless expanse, awe-inspiring waves, a space for yearning around which countless myths are based, in which anything seems possible. The elemental power of the ocean instills fear in us. Yet at the same time, we've always wanted to conquer the oceans. They also promise us great gains. Even the earliest businessmen didn't dare venture into the dangerous oceans to make a profit. Later, with better ships, the exploitation of the ocean progressed more and more. In its early days, whaling was lethally dangerous for sailors, but the work was good money. Valuable whale fat was required for candles, cosmetics, and many other uses. The extinction of the whale was only prevented by the realization that crude oil could be used as a replacement for whale fat. Nowadays, fish stocks are in similar danger to the whale. Not a single fish can escape the trawl nets that are now dragged across the seabed. Many species are threatened by extinction.
Although the fish stocks in the deep sea are being ruthlessly exploited, the seabed remains unknown to us. It's true to this day. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep seabed. Every impression of the seabed is unique. These researchers are the first to be able to see the deep seabed in the same place that the earlier experiments happened 19 years ago. In almost two decades, technology has moved forward exponentially. Today, much clearer images of this mysterious world are possible. When we take a TV camera across the seabed and we see the image live, we're the first in the history of humanity to have seen this part of the Earth. Time and again. Even now, I'm getting goosebumps. New every time. For me, that's spectacular. Extracting manganese nodules once seemed within reach, at a time that was characterized by a similarly pioneering spirit. In the 1960s and 70s, people believed nothing was impossible. Man had succeeded in reaching the moon and even standing on its surface. There you go. The Mariana Trench, probably the deepest part of the sea, had been navigated by the Frenchman Jean Picard with his submarine. What else was lying out of our reach? People dreamed of houses on the seabed where they could live just as naturally as on land. But this optimistic time was also one of the most dangerous in history, the time of the Cold War between East and West. The Soviet Union and the USA stood irreconcilably against each other and left no stone unturned in their spying efforts. When a Russian submarine sank in the middle of the Pacific, the USA used manganese nodules as a cover-up story. A ship built by the billionaire Howard Hughes was apparently going to research how manganese nodules could best be extracted. In reality, the American CIA wanted to salvage the submarine. It was the most expensive CIA venture in history. The international public swallowed the story of the manganese nodule mining. The submarine, however, tore apart while being retrieved. Only parts of it made it to the deck to be analyzed. The hype surrounding the manganese nodules back then was short-lived. Ores were cheap. The mines on land seemed inexhaustible. Today, on the other hand, extraction from the seabed seems inevitable. All over the world, research is being carried out looking into how the raw materials can best be extracted from the nodules. The Rhine-Westphalian Technical College in Aachen is at the forefront of this field. At first, the operation looks simple. The nodules are made smaller. and melted at a high temperature. A large problem is the low concentration of ores. More than 90% of the manganese nodules consist of sand and manganese. Both materials can be used, but are already in good supply on land. It is not necessary to carry out costly deep sea mining for sand and manganese. In addition, iron and non-ferrous metals come out of the smelter together in metal clumps and need to be separated with other processes. Very little non-ferrous metal for a large output of energy. Amongst other things, it's due to this metal that deep sea mining is still at the top of the agenda of the European Union. Nickel. Countless products rely on nickel to be produced. 
Stainless steel, for example, like the kind produced by this company and exported across the whole world. The steel industry remains to this day a backbone of the German economy. Due to the increasing urbanization, its importance will continue to grow into the future, as we also need steel for building work. But it is estimated that global nickel supplies will be exhausted in 40 years. And what then? Researchers are currently testing which substances can replace nickel, but the alternatives are not yet wholly convincing. Up until now, Germany has mostly imported nickel from Russia. The town Norilsk is Russia's center of nickel mining. Stalin built it purely for the mine workers. The extraction of ores has meanwhile completely destroyed the surrounding area. For strategic reasons, many countries are looking for an alternative to importing from Russia. For that reason, countless companies around the world are at the starting gates to begin with manganese nodule extraction over the coming years. They rely on the technical know-how from other projects. A Belgian company has already created artificial islands in many places around the world, using sand that has been pumped up from the seabed. If we believe the engineers, it doesn't make a big difference whether they extract sand or manganese nodules from the seabed. But is that true? With this so-called trencher, the Belgians lay cables and pipelines on the seabed. It practically presents a prototype for a manganese nodule collector. And in principle, it can be converted with just one tube. The market situation is clearly in the foreground for the Belgians too. Well, we have five metals in the polymetallic nodules. It's copper, it's nickel, molybdenum, cobalt, and manganese. But we see this as a nickel project. Nickel is the most important metal in our polymetallic nodules. The trencher is currently being deployed in depths of around 2,000 meters. It's been built especially for the high pressure underwater. Any sensitive electronic systems are hidden behind thick metal layers. The tank-like vehicle weighs 55 tons, and the collector is set to be even bigger. It's not difficult to imagine the havoc this would wreak on the seabed. Ecological impact is always important, and we from the DEME group are uh, doing our utmost to reduce our impact. And we have to also consider that we need those metals coming from somewhere. So terrestrial mining also has an impact, so we will do our best to prove that seabed mining impact is less than terrestrial mining. A tube instead of a claw, a third larger, equipped with yet more robust chains, and the collector is complete though it would be moving through waters twice as deep. All around the world, many companies are working on concepts for manganese nodule mining. Essentially, the principle is always the same. A tank-like vehicle is released from a ship onto the seabed. Technicians sit on board the ship who steer the machine. On the seabed, the collector sucks the nodules up. It takes the top 15 centimeters of the ground up with it and creates great swirls of sediment. Still in the water, the nodules are gathered in interim storage and finally are pumped on board. During the extraction, the sediment on the ground, which normally hardly moves at all, drifts through the water, only settles back down very slowly. The researchers on the Zona are investigating what kind of effects that will have. A diving robot takes on the role of the collector underwater. It is lowered down firmly on the seabed using a remote control in order to imitate the damage caused by mining the nodules. The 
Fine sediment can be dangerous for the animals and plants on the seabed. There are in some parts reduced metals and sediments inside which then consume oxygen in the lower water column close to the ground and then also release these metals. In the manganese nodules and sediments around them there are some toxic metals such as copper, nickel, cobalt, rare earth metals which have a toxic effect. In order to see more precisely how the animals react to this disturbance, the researchers catch individual animals on the seabed using the diving robot and expose the released metals to a concentration that will be about realistic during mining. The sea cucumber tries to escape. It's determined, but unsuccessful. The marine biologist Pedro Martinez wants to understand which and how many animals live here in the manganese nodule fields. The so-called multicora is meant to cut out samples from the sediment. Pedro Martinez is looking at the question of how the animals deal with being disturbed. As here in this very area, the animal world was disturbed by his colleagues 26 years ago. Has it recovered? There is much excitement as the sea researchers heave the multicora back onto deck. Up until now, they haven't managed to take samples with it. And without that, the marine biologists cannot carry out any examinations. Did it work this time? The researchers have to accept another disappointment. No sediment has gathered in the pipes, only water. They have more luck using another method. Countless animals have landed in a trap on the seabed. The work begins immediately. Up to now, nobody has known which plants and animals live on the nodules and around them. If the animals don't appear anywhere else, it means that the mining of the nodules is their death sentence. So now every single creature will be examined on board and carefully categorized. All the samples are prepared to be taken away. Across the sea, they will later be delivered to laboratories all over Europe. treasure chest of samples, comparable to the first German deep sea expedition, and years of work for many biologists. Pedro Martinez can only conduct a precise analysis of the animals back on land, in his laboratory in Wilhelmshaven. It took weeks until the containers finally arrived. Just like before, unknown species are still sketched out today. For Martinez, it is certain that every single one of the tiny unknown animals could play an important role. Ecosystems are, after all, extremely complex. Every kind is unique. 
each plays a role in the ecosystem and also has a place in the food web. So if certain species disappear, even if they're small, that can then have a measurable influence. The genetic analyses have not yet been concluded. The scientists will only be able to say in a few months' time what kinds of animals live solely in the nodule fields. Nonetheless, it is already clear. There are very many species in the deep sea, and most remain unknown. We estimate that 99% of the species that live there have not yet been classified. 99%. With mining, we would wipe out life without knowing how important these organisms could be for the entire ecosystem. An incalculable risk. 26 years ago, colleagues of the current research crew left tracks on the seabed. Today, the scientists will find out if they're still visible. Tracks in mud. After 26 years, in the deep sea, this is not as absurd as it seems. This autonomous underwater vehicle, known as an AUV, is meant to clarify if this is true. It will take thousands of photos of the seabed to do so. Later, the computer will put these photos together in a large mosaic another piece of the puzzle to help us understand the deep sea. The staff on board, the biologists and geochemists, also want to see what has changed biologically in 19, 26 years, or what has changed geochemically. And then we want to use that to make a statement on how quickly the deep sea would regenerate after mining has taken place and how intensive the damage would be at all. The images will answer these big questions. Will these tracks still be visible? The scientists wait impatiently for the underwater vehicle. The expedition has brought one surprise after another. Experts had all presumed the seabed was even. However, in fact, the researchers on the Zona have discovered it's full of hills and valleys. These will complicate mining the nodules. The computer slowly puts together a mosaic from the images of the seabed. After 26 years, the tracks from the plowing harrow are still just as clear as if they had been made yesterday. But how bad is that? That's where opinions differ. There are also investigations in shallow waters at the shelf where icebergs really plow through the seabed. They leave iceberg plow marks, which are considerably larger than the small scratches that we make. They create a relief in the seabed, sometimes of several tens of metres in height difference, and life blossoms there. But will it be like that in the deep sea? The researchers want to take a ground sample from the place the ploughing harrow swelled up sediment 26 years ago. This will give them an idea of whether the seabed has changed or regenerated. The output of the gravity corer is very precise work. Can you move the ship five meters to the north again? Finally, the right position has been found, and the gravity corer sinks four kilometers down. If it is not lowered down onto exactly the right part of the ground, the sample taking will not be successful. Winch stopped. Winch stopped. Ship is 
now in the right position. Lab bridge, OK, I'll be in touch. Generally, in manganese nodule mining, the upper 5 to 10 centimetres of the sedimentary soil are taken away or significantly damaged, which didn't happen as intensively with the ploughing harrow. That means that the fauna, or the animals that live in them, will die or be removed completely. The bacteria will be similarly affected. This means that this depletion of organic material, the consumption of nitrate and oxygen, will be reduced or will completely disappear. Nicht so in dem Maße oder ganz verschwunden sein. How big is the damage caused? And how far does it continue to the deeper layers of the seabed? Answers to this are to be found in a several meter long sediment core from the seabed. Matthias Heckel is examining samples from various depths. The sediment core operation was successful. On board the Zona, many staff members help out when a task needs to be completed quickly. The team quickly brings the core to the cold storage room in order to take out individual samples. Due to the ploughing harrow 26 years ago, oxygen got into areas in which it usually doesn't occur. The first results that we can see, primarily relating to the oxygen profile, is that oxygen can freely penetrate into the sediment. The microbial activity in the surface sediment is still significantly damaged after 26 years. I had expected that the microbial activity would have been able to recover more quickly. Damaging geochemical processes in the ocean can signify a dangerous interference. The seas are giant CO2 storage spaces. They absorb CO2 from the air. It's partly bound in plankton and sinks to the ground. It's partly transported by streams deep underwater and can stay there under certain conditions for centuries. An additional part is given back to the atmosphere from the surface. Because of its large surface, the seabed, especially in the deep sea, is the great motor of our global carbon cycle. It's the great stabiliser of our climate on a timescale of around 100,000 years. In addition, there is a second cycle that we come into contact with when we operate in the deep sea, and that is oxygen. At the end of the day, the floor of the deep sea stabilises oxygen levels. We're now talking about a time scale of around more than 2 million years. The seas are more than 4 billion years old. They emerged on a planet full of volcanoes. People are not able to overturn the elemental forces of the oceans in a day. As the first rains fell, they created the foundations for the oceans we have today, and thus made life on our planet possible. Processes that we set in motion today could have effects in thousands of years. Well, essentially, you can say that the experiment that was carried out here in 1989 provided the findings that when mining is carried out extensively, there is a lasting detrimental effect on the environment. And regarding the regulations that are now to be created by the international seabed authorities, it shows us very clearly that how much and how coherently areas are allowed to be mined must be somehow regulated. The industrialization of the seas is moving at an unstoppable pace. Aside from the territories of individual countries, the open ocean belongs in principle to nobody and to everybody. The International Seabed Authority was created in 1996 in order to protect the seabed. The researchers on the Zona work in conflict between environmental protection, politics and economics. The economic side is even on board with them, in the form of Johannes Post, the CEO of the Deep Sea Mining Alliance, a merger of businesses who want to promote deep sea mining. Even Post thinks that the Seabed Authority needs to take swift action. The mining regulations really need to be written and implemented over the course of the next one or two years. Because there are already companies around the world, and also countries, who want to start with initial tests imminently. So it must be clearly stated somewhere 
where exactly the regulated boundaries stand. The authority has its headquarters in Jamaica. It grants licenses for the manganese nodule belt. Companies are not able to apply for licenses, only countries are. Whoever is granted one is able to initially start exploring the area and later to mine the natural resources. This also applies to the tiny island state, Nauru. The people in Nauru see deep sea mining as a chance for economic prosperity. Consequently, the government agreed to an offer from the company Nautilus Minerals to apply collaboratively for a license to start exploring. None of the small, poor states were really very interested. Until then, large companies came and said, you have the ability to get a license area. We'll organize everything for you and you'll be our sponsor state and we will then manage the mining, including the exploration. You'll have no costs and you'll even be paid for your license. But does it work as simply as that? The islanders already once experienced sudden riches from natural resources and a subsequent crash. Not even 40 years ago, Nauru was one of the richest states in the world, so rich that the government didn't impose any tax. On average, every citizen owned three cars for 29 kilometers of tarmac road on the island. The wealth of Nauru's came from one single resource, phosphate. Since the year 2000, the resources have become almost completely exhausted. Nauru plunged almost overnight to the status of a developing country. Since then, the island has withdrawn from the contract with Nautilus and wants to extract manganese nodules independently. Will that bring renewed prosperity? The question is ultimately, how much really goes back to the population? What does a third world country get from it when they get mined by a large Western company? That leads to the danger that only a small percentage of the upper class in the country gets the money and the rest of the population get maybe two or three additional schools and that's it. Jobs will certainly not be created in these countries because the positions needed demand highly specialised understanding of the deep sea mining business and these staff are just not available there. When filling the roles for the job, again, only the large industrialized states get a chance. Germany, France, Belgium, and other EU countries. Russia, too. Yet it is questionable where these countries will process the nodules. There is just as high an amount of waste as in land deposits, because at the moment at least the international legislation on the high seas states that the leftover slurry may not be put back, so the disposal needs to be taken care of on land somehow. And well, for me, as industrialised countries, that's a point that we have to really think about, where we want to smelt these manganese nodules in the end. Latin America is not far, and to get the manganese nodules all the way to Germany would not make sense economically. But none of the Latin American countries that come into question also have anywhere near the same environmental standards as the EU states. And the non-ferrous metals can be thoroughly poisonous for humans. Could countries like Germany make sure that the smelting of the nodules does not make people here ill and increase the misery? And that our prosperity and growth does not trigger an ecological crisis? In 2077, we'll know the answer. Presumably, those responsible would have chosen the easiest path. In this case, mining the nodules would have brought the industrialized countries non-ferrous metals for a few more decades and would have given nothing to the people of Latin America. In 2077, the aging research ship, the Zona, sails again in the manganese nodule belt. Now it is fully automated. The state of the seabed has surpassed even the worst fears of the researchers of the past. The diving robot meanders through the destroyed wasteland. At least, some animals have dared to return to the area after mining was given up. 
Even in 2077, we can't yet say how the damage to the ecosystem will affect the climate. Millions of years will go by until new manganese nodules form. They are by no means a renewable resource. Should they be mined anyway? Even the researchers reach different conclusions. It's a huge resource that is deep down in the ocean. And if I mine something on land, I also make a very large impact that could influence humanity more directly than if I do it under the sea. Ultimately, it's a question for society as a whole. Do we want to touch everything that we have the technical capability to? Or do we want to progress a little in our actions, a move towards methods that really are regenerative? Before we now approach a new resource in the ecosystem that is essentially important for the whole planet, for which we cannot accurately assess the consequences. Who decides on the priority? Deep sea mining has a financially powerful lobby. The seabed, doesn't.